Partnerships and relationships are hard to find. I see how you can see that line. Um, I want you to think for a moment about what might be the connection between a World War II hospital or a hospital used during World War II for soldiers, American soldiers, swampland, bush rangers, floriography, fiction, truisms, history, positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning and achievement. What do all of these things have in common? Well, I hope as the um, evening progresses, you'll have a sense of how these things take on a life of their own in this project. What we were interested in doing, as you can see from this title screen, is to look at some working with public spaces and public art. And we conducted this project with a group of teachers and their students in secondary schools. We had students in Year 8, right through to students in Year 11 in the different schools. At Hornsby, I think we had 120 students in one group. And at Burwood, I think there were 24 or thereabouts uh, in the class, so we had enormous variations. Another thing to keep in mind is I didn't want to over control the project, must, much to the frustration of the teachers at certain points, because <coughs> I thought it was extremely important that the project made sense and resonated in the schools in which they were working. So I, I was extremely keen that they brought their agency to bear on what this project was about. If I just go on, if I can. Um, I got a research faculty grant to do this, a COFA research grant, and we were keen to work with the, cultivate, uh, the Curating Cities project. Most of you would know about the, creative, uh, the Curating Cities project, Jill Bennett's um, ARC project, where the intention over a five-year period is to look at how you might curate or care for space in the, um, in the Sydney area. We were very keen to piggyback on that project, or as Jill talked about very early on within her project, that there would be a patchwork of practice beyond just what artists and designers were doing, where we looked at how we could care for space in our own local communities and so on. And we picked that up quite seriously to see what could schools actually do in thinking about local ecologies, local social ecologies, how might <coughs> we intervene in those only with temporal works, but one would hope with projects that would have longer term purposes as well. So some of you would remember Rebar talking last year. Rebar was a big influence on us. And moving on, just a few other bits of background that are useful. We were keen to um, situate ourselves within that Curating <coughs> Cities project. We had access to the Experimental Arts Conference. We went to the Curating Cities Conference and exhibition that was down at Circular Quay and Customs House. We were especially interested in Natalie Jeremajenko's work, the artist who works with a background in physics, uh, bioengineering, and it goes on and on. Uh, an artist who was interested in proposing non-violent futures, but futures where social change was extremely important. We were also interested in the Try This at Home project, which was on at Object. Some of you would know that, and we were about that, and we were also very keen to look at the work of the Slow Art Collective and uh, Natural Fuse, amongst the others, that were, including Makeshift, that were showing. I've mentioned Rebar. We were really interested in their idea of uh, user-generated urbanism. And some of you would know with Rebar, they have their parking days, which are now an international event around the world on about the 16th or 17th, 18th, 19th of September, not long gone, and um, big events around the world that, that began with Rebar in San Francisco. We're also interested in data visualisation, tracking and augmented reality. We look to people internationally for that, and we look to locals such as Josh Hall, who's a PhD student here, who is doing some terrific work with augmented reality. And we were also interested in other public interventions that were taking place. We referred to people like Janet Cardiff and Blast Theory. All of these people gave us a springboard, these kinds of activities in public spaces, looking at the contemporary world, gave us a springboard for the sort of work that we were interested in doing. 
Now some of you would say this doesn't sound like secondary art education, where's the painting and drawing? And uh, this is something that we were very keen to bring to your attention, that, um, that those sort of stereotypes about what goes on in secondary art classrooms isn't the only thing that is going on in secondary art classrooms. And uh, we were keen to share this with you tonight. Um, I wanted also to bring to your attention that the teachers themselves, I thought they'd be surprised to see this, look at them, they're looking at this going, oh, oh, oh how did this happen? <laughs> anyway, um, I took videos of the teachers when they were working with their students. I'd had a background in doing ethnographic work in schools with teachers. I went in and interviewed the teachers. I took videos of what they were doing with the students at various points. And so we have a very rich database that I have access to, but the teachers also documented their work. Why were these teachers chosen? They're all regarded as experts in what they do. And I have a very strong view that the teacher is the, most, is the strongest agency in the stu student's creative work. And that's just not a belief. It's the sort of thing that's come through through the research that I've done previously by looking at teachers and students in art classrooms. So I think of that art classroom as a, a social space, a social reality, a place which is different from what happens next door. Teachers have that much influence on students. So what goes on in one classroom, as you would know yourselves from being here and your experience at school, what happens in one classroom is not the same as what is permitted and so on in another class. So my figuring was, get a group of very good teachers together, let's have a look at what we can do with an extremely important project in contemporary society. So they brought a background knowledge of having worked with installations with students before, having a great interest in contemporary technologies. They were also well versed in the syllabus and what could be done. So they were working within the constraints of the syllabuses, but really pushing the edges with those and helping to rethink aspects of those. And uh, they had a commitment to the project um, that I think grew as we worked with the project. Having a good group of people was also good because they wouldn't let you take, they wouldn't take anything for granted and they worked off one another. So there was a, in the best possible sense, a competitive edge in that everyone wanted to do well. So it wasn't just a case of a touchy-feely, oh let's all be creative, but rather what can we do, how can we work with one another, what might I do with thinking about what you're doing and so on. So it generated, I think what happened was the, the bar got lifted in what we might do. That's of no disrespect for the teachers because they were chosen because they were extremely good at what they did and I was hoping that that would be the sort of thing that would happen. So the students then are the beneficiaries of the involvement that the teachers have in the project. I was given a little bit of money for the project which was very helpful with buying trackers, cameras and also providing relief for the teachers and it also let us go to some of these events that I've referred to that um, NIA and Curating Cities was running just a couple of key points. So I was interested in what was the contribution of these teachers as key teachers and how could they transform local spaces with public art. A caveat here would be, or a constraint would be, it was never intended that the project, the works would be ongoing. They were temporal works that were being made. That I think is a strength and a weakness of the project in that it's strange to be talking about sustainability and public art, but putting limits on the time in which it exists. But we couldn't go any further than what we did in the, in the project, I don't think. We were very keen to build that idea of an ecology in the local area. That was extended in some cases where um, Karen, for instance, went into the city with Elspeth, one of her teachers, and worked with the students in the city, and she'll talk to you more about that. And we were very keen to look at how, and as I said to you, relative to the work that I was doing, how could you have practices which were sensitive to local areas, but actually be doing something which was bigger than just the local area. So I was looking at these as a set of case studies. I'll finish with this next slide. One of the things that we were interested in doing, some of you might know this diagram from your own time at school, but we were interested in, just if I could draw your attention here, these points especially, and thinking about this. So for a student, what is the relationship of a student to their work? Normally the student would think about themselves as an artist and they would make a work. But what we found with these projects is the, the students changed roles because they became part of the work when we were involved in these installations and performances. And what happened because these were real public events that took place, the students had a first-hand 
experience in that word, in that word experience, but they had a first-hand understanding of how the audience <coughs> matters to making an artwork in a way that they may not have experienced before. Because good, a good number of the students actually exchanged with the public about the works that were made. And you'll hear more about that as we go on. So this was pivotal to our thinking. I would like to write at length about this. I think this is a key aspect of the project. And I think for the teachers, this was a key aspect of the work we did. We were also interested in sustainability. I think that's a very problematic term in many respects, as important as it is. And I think Amy summed it up, um, one of the teachers involved in the project. We just weren't interested in this being a greenwash, you know, a modern sort of greenwash. And so we were interested in that, and I think we have realised aspects of sustainability reasonably well in some cases and not so well in others. But I think time plays a significant role in that. So in the longer term, I think some of the things that the students took on will manifest themselves, but we wouldn't be able to say at the end of this project that this, the, this helped sustainability in this way or this way. But I think the general values about sustainability would have been cultivated as a <coughs> result of taking on this project. I'll stop there and um, I'll ask now, I uh, think if, Melinda, if you could come up next, please. Hi, my name is Melinda Hodges. Um, I'm a visual arts teacher at Mariah College. Um, I wanted to talk about my involvement in the Cultivating Urban Ecologies project, both at Mariah College and last year um, when I was a teacher at International Grammar School. Um, so I'm just going to start off by talking about how I got involved in the project at IGS um, and what we did at IGS last year as part of the pilot project. Uh, and then this year, um, what I've done at Mariah with my year, current Year 11 class. Okay, so this is International Grammar School, which is in the city um, in Ultimo, and it's behind Broadway Shopping Centre. And originally, um, this school was chosen um, to be part of the Cultivating Urban Ecologies project as a pilot project because it's right in the centre of Sydney and one of the, uh, one of the only schools that's actually in um, Sydney Council. Um, and so Ultimo as an area has a very interesting um, <coughs> landscape, um, a very interesting social dynamic. Um, and the project that I organised last year aimed to kind of look at and map the streetscape of Ultimo um, as an interdisciplinary project. Um, so I worked with a geography teacher and a languages teacher to create a collaborative project um, with 90 visual arts, well they were just year eight students. Um, and we went out on a two day excursion into the streets of Ultimo where students used um, numerous kind of things like GPS trackers, cameras, drawings, iPhones to map and kind of chart uh, the social, economic, geographical um, kind of landscape of Ultimo and then we brought it back and kind of created um, a, a collaborative kind of chart or map or patchwork of the area. Um, so for that project some of our influences that we looked at were the Try This at Home exhibition at Object Gallery. Um, this was quite influential because this um, exhibition was happening at the time we were carrying out the project at IGS um, and so we were able to as a school take part in the exhibition um, and they lent us one of their natural fuse plants which you can see um, in this artwork and I'll show you a picture in a minute of the kids with the natural fuse artwork. Um, we also looked at a Melbourne based collective called Slow Art Collective who were very interested in using recycled materials and junk collected from streetscapes to create their artwork. So we also kind of charted the, the rubbish and the um, kind of junk on the streets of Ultimo as, as the kids noted that down. Um, and at the same time, uh, the Art <coughs> About project in Sydney um, was happening and there was this project called the Laneways Project and the international group that Kerry mentioned, Rebar, um, were part of this project. So a lot of the kids went and visited this um, installation in the street which was um, down in Circular Quay. So we looked at Rebar as well as part of that um, user-generated urbanism. Um, so these are some of the students with the natural fuse that we were um, lent by the object gallery for the time. Um, so we had this plant for about three months um, and the students interacted, and the students in year eight interacted with this inter, uh, kind of intervention. It's a kind of take it home, try this at home. Um, and the plant generated electricity through um, 
it's like through carbon trading. So the kids got to interact with this work. Um, and they, we also did a big case study on the Try This at Home exhibition and the artists involved in this exhibition. Um, these are some of the kids um, out on the street during the two-day excursion. Um, and this was an article published in the Inner West Courier um, about um, how we were kind of interacting with the street. So I took the 90 kids out into the streetscape with five teachers um, and they recorded the streetscape, mapping it, um, using a variety of things, mainly GPS tracking, um, and this was the first time kind of GPS tracking had been used in schools in this way. Um, and we had about six GPS trackers, um, and we recorded a lot of kind of tracks and different the different routes that different groups took on the day. And these are just some of the kind of things that they started last year creating. So the top image is a panoramic image, um, 3D panorama, using a program called Photosynth. Um, and then the bottom two images are uh, images taken from the GPS trackers of the different um, routes that the different groups took. So there was four groups of 25 students um, and each group took a different route around the city and the different coloured lines indicate the different kind of uh, the nature of them going in and out of different spaces in the city over the two days. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, the Mariah College and then I'll come back to some of the results of the project for both schools and the differences between the schools. Um, this year I started at Mariah College which is a, a Jewish day school in, um, in the eastern suburbs and I decided to um, re-look at the project um, with a group of year 11 students. So there was 15 year 11 students in my class and it's a visual arts um, class going into the HSC for 2013. Um, and they were already studying a site-specific unit for Term 1, so I thought that um, we could kind of combine the site-specific work they were looking at with this nature, this idea of cultivating an urban ecology um, within the site of Mariah itself. So um, the project involved the 15 students, the first thing they did was research um, two sites of interest, two key sites in their local area, um, which were Mariah College itself, which has a very interesting history, um, and Centennial Park, which also has a really interesting history and natural and man-made kind of history, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and what students did is that they created site-specific works um, for these two sites through their research. Um, that were time-based, um, temporal kind of interventions into the spaces and which relied heavily on the audience engagement. In fact, audience was probably integral to all of their projects um, as they were kind of interventions and very interactive for the audience. Um, so these are two archival images. Um, the one on the left is a picture of Mariah, the site of Mariah College. Uh, in 1935 um, and this was when Mariah College was the Eastern Suburbs Hospital. So Mariah, the site of Mariah used to be uh, the Eastern Suburbs Hospital from 1924 to 1980 and during that time um, a lot of different things happened. So in the 1940s during World War II it was uh, a, a hospital for American naval um, soldiers so a lot of the kids researched that interesting fact about the hospital. Um, and they also looked at the transformation of the site of Mariah over time from the hospital and there, there's a really fantastic site here which is like the Sydney Health site and it has heaps of archival photographs of Mariah when it used to be the hospital. Um, so they took heaps of information from this site. It's also got a really fantastic timeline that um, documents the, the transformation of that place over time and the different types of functions it played as a hospital. Um, and they looked at it right up to today. So it only became the site of Mariah in the 1980s because Mariah used to, um, when Mariah started, it was in a Bellevue Hill site and then it changed over to the Eastern Suburbs Hospital site. Um, and most of the buildings were demolished, but a lot of the areas still exist, like the reception area of Mariah today is part of the old Eastern Suburbs Hospital. Um, and this is a picture on the right, just an archival photograph from the Centennial Parklands website which is also a fantastic website for research. Um, and about half the class chose to research Mariah as their site, and about half the class chose to look at Centennial Park. And Centennial Park also has a really diverse history. In the 1800s, um, it was a swampland, 
Um, and then in the late 1800s, it was the main source for Sydney water. Um, and then in the early 1900s, it was transformed into the beautiful kind of park and leisure ground it is today. Um, and it's got a lot of functions over time. So now it's used a lot for bicycle riding, picnicking, um, for tours of the park and things like that. So um, the students like really investigated the different kind of functions that the park has been used for and also charted different things about the park, like the natural typography of the park, but also the man-made kind of interventions into the park since the early 1900s. And so the first thing um, the students did as part of their research was created kind of a documented form in the form of kind of a narrative. Um, this was a back to front, I called them concertinas, um, and they're little, like, little books that stood up um, and in this concertina they had to chart their kind of research um, for either of the sites and also they had to look at kind of the layering of history. So this whole project had to do with kind of narrative and forgotten histories and charting the stories of the past. So kind of bringing or reclaiming Sydney's history and kind of making it, making people aware of what had happened in these two sites. Um, and so through these concertinas, the students were able to kind of chart the history um, and also chart their ideas for an installation. So the one up the top here, that is one that charts the history of Centennial Park. And I'll show you this girl's project in a minute, but she ended up making um, some umbrellas, like parasols for the park, called parasols in the park. Um, and she took people into the park, students into the park, and got them to picnic in the park with the parasols. But the parasols actually documented she created the whole top of the umbrella um, with canvas and textiles and layering and they documented kind of old maps of the park and a nature in the park, um, wildlife in the park, but also the other umbrella charted man's intervention into the park. Um, and the one down the bottom is a bit scary, but um, one of the girls is going to talk about it in the video sh I'll show in a minute. And she looked at kind of the mental, a lot of them. Uh, we're very interested in the mental ward that was at Mariah when it was an eastern suburbs hospital. So and and ideas of kind of ghosts um, still haunting the corridors of Mariah today. So a lot of the installations have quite an eerie vibe to them. Um, and when they were installed in Mariah as video projections and things like that, the students um, got people to interact with them and they were quite um, eerie and ghost-like. Um, I just wanted to quickly look at some of the influences that we looked at um, for Mariah. So, uh, we were very interested in this idea of the audio walk, the audio tour, um, the interactive level, the uh, interactive street performances. So we looked at people like Goldsworthy, uh, Cardiff, Janet Cardiff, and Blast Theory, who's, who Kerry's mentioned. We were also the kids were also interested in video and photographic projections to engage the audience. So we looked at people like Christian Boltanski um, and Bill Viola, um, and we also looked at um, sensory based installation um, with people like Christelle and Jean-Claude and also Janet Lawrence. Now I just wanted to show a quick video because this video I feel really um, documents the students reactions there to their work and also how their ideas about art changed um, over time and the video goes for about five minutes. <coughs> My name is Helen Moore. A very long time ago, in 1943, I worked as a nurse here. I will be leading you to different parts of the school while I take you back in time, 65 years. You may think that Mariah College has always been Mariah College, but in fact, this school has a rich history the Eastern Suburbs Hospital is the original name of this camp. Well, I think I just it came up because I was so fascinated that Mariah no, like, actually used to be a hospital, so I thought that I could sort of show that in a way that I could use technology to push the boundaries of modern art, and I think it's really important that we learn to use technology and push it to its boundaries so we can use it to show people a history of Mariah and everything else. You should be holding an A3 pocket with several photos in them, numbered from 1 to 13. 
You should currently be standing in the reception area. Pull out photo number one from the pocket. This is the Eastern Suburbs Hospital reception, 60 years ago. Keep walking straight until you see stairs with yellow markings on them on your right. Photo 3 is what you should see on your right. Walk up the stairs and turn right and keep walking along that path with the white railings on your left. Um, I photoshop to edit my photos, cameras to film, um, to film. I volunteer around the school um, looking at the photos and doing the actual tour. And yeah, and I use my, um, my iPod to, um, to take her around the school and like, while she listens to her um, audio tour. Sit on the white bench near the tree while I finish telling you my story about Jack. When he fully recovered, I was extremely happy for him, but sad because he was going to leave and return to America. But Jack took me by surprise. I got the shock of my life. I was sitting where you are sitting right now, on this exact bench sulking about Jack's departure with my hands covering my face. I felt someone's hands gently pulling mine away from my face. I opened my eyes and saw Jack in front of me, kneeling with a beautiful silver ring resting in its purple velvet box. I was speechless and overwhelmed. No words could describe how I felt. I answered yes without any thought. He wanted to marry me and spend the rest of our lives together in the States. And so we did. Photo 13 is Jack and I on our wedding day. Hospital? School? Who knows what will be next? I used the anthem of the American soldiers to represent the battle that my protagonist was going to to fight for this country because our school used to be the hospital and it used to care for veterans during that time. So. American Eagle, because there are lots of American, um, I think it was naval, Navy passengers at our school. Um, it's a bit <laughs> grotesque, but um, yeah, that's just one of the, I tried to represent like a hospital patient and just some words that might describe the characteristic. Uh, this, I just wanted to quickly end with some of the other installations which the video had in it, um, including the parasols in the park, uh, video projections into the school, uh, kind of the gates, well, this one was called the School Gates, which was um, Christo inspired, um, and this one was called the Ghost of Mariah and video projection into the school. So, um, yeah, and I'll, yeah, I'll answer any questions in the question time. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Amy Yong Siri. I'm a teacher at Burwood Girls High School. I, just before um, I get into the project, I just want to give you a little bit of background on the students and the school itself. It's a comprehensive girls high school, which means that um, it takes in a lot of the local students from that area. Um, and the implication is that they have a lot of knowledge about the, the local area. <coughs> Um, which was really great for this project. I did have a class of 24 students and then ended up with 22 um, with a couple of students moving away. And this is a photographic and digital media class. So this is the student's first, um, I guess, introduction into using um, Premiere Pro, iMovie, Photoshop, um, you know, all the digital um, equipment. So this is quite a huge undertaking for them and um, it was it took us about 12 solid weeks to actually complete the whole project give or take a few weeks because they're out at swimming carnivals or whatever okay so a blueprint of the program um, so we've got phase one, um, which was mapping Burwood itself. So they're very similar to um, Melinda's project at IC IGS in that um, regard. Um, phase two, which is a um, postcard to Chimerica, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. And then phase three is um, a surprise. <laughs> and uh, I'll just get to that right at the end. Um, okay, so they're, they're basically the three stages of art making. 
in each stage, students undertook a little bit of studying um, into the work of other practitioners to help them kind of negotiate what it was that they were trying to make. Um, and they would either draw on the conceptual practice or um, the techniques um, that other practitioners had used. And the core idea, as Kerry alluded to, was um, the idea that curating is to care. And how can we care for our city without um, greenwashing and um, doing it in a sustainable way, which actually just meant embedding ideas into the students' minds. We did an initial brainstorm with the students um, and their initial responses including uh, included things like throwing rubbish in the bin and recycling PET bottles and using green bags when they go to the supermarket and I think I just really wanted to push um, beyond that um, for them and in the evaluation they have they've actually acknowledged that it's a, it's it is beyond what they had thought it was okay so this is um, one of the artworks from phase one which was mapping Burwood and this is a quote um, from a catalogue which is called The Art of Mapping, an exhibition um, in London last year or the year before. And this is just to frame um, the idea of mapping in the students' minds and what cartography actually is. So um, students looked at a number of ideas that could be documented, so the idea of emotional um, sorry, mapping emotional ideas, mapping values, mapping physical um, places. And they also looked at different ways that artists represented this in their maps. Um, so these are some of the artists that the students looked at for this phase of the program. So they looked at Laurie Frick, Simon Patterson, Nigel Peak, Grayson Perry and Jeremy Wood. And the last being the um, the practitioner that the students focused most on um, visually. And here are some examples of um, the students' maps. So some of the maps that the students explored, um, keeping in mind again that the students do know a lot about the, um, the Burwood area and that they it took them a little bit of time to try and break beyond a place that they're overly familiar with. So um, students often think about Burwood as um, the site for a very big Westfield shopping centre. So it was very hard to um, try and get students to think creatively about that. But this was important in developing the next two um, phases of the project. So some of their maps explored various routes to and from school um, and what they saw on those journeys. Um, one of the concepts were a group of people wearing headphones and not engaged with Burwood, so um, documenting um, the disengagement amongst the community and their peers <coughs> and also um, drifting or derive as, as uh, suggested by Debord. So, um, one of the groups um, did two experiments, I suppose. They let one student loose and she was to direct um, the girls with the GPS trackers as to where she'd like to go. And then in their second experiment, it was blindfolding another student who would just follow her senses of um, hearing and smell to navigate her way through Burwood. So here are some of the um, results of that. So the students worked in small groups using the GPS trackers that Dr Thomas purchased, which was really great. They also took out some DSLRs to take photos along the way and they composited these um, using Photoshop. And they also, in um, the trackers, there's, it's a Garmin tracker and there's special software where you can actually take the, um, the track off the device and put it onto a... Um, Google Maps, which was really helpful. So after they did that, this is like a, I guess, a research into the area before they got started. Then we looked at um, phase two, which is um, Chimerica. I know it's spot kind of strangely there. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this project. It's um, a project run by Demetrios Eames, who is the grandson of the Eames, and who I accidentally stumbled across um, and 
what he says about this project is that Chimerica, he says, basically I've created an alternate universe that is largely consistent with our linear world, but with much different stories, peoples, flora, fauna, even physical laws. So um, he then goes around installing markers um, and historical sites so that uh, and different people are invited to visit um, his version of America, which is called Chimerica. So then the students were asked to do a, a postcard that we um, are going to send to Chimerica. That they've all finished them. Um, I was a little bit mean and made them redo some of them because they were done in a rush. And um, they were asked to put a little bit of a historical, some historical facts about Burwood that were really interesting to them and to document that onto a postcard. And at this stage, we looked at, um, they had a research task to undertake. So this is a snippet from their assessment task. Um, they had to look at, in groups, had to look at um, one of the following artists or practitioners. And then they had to use the conceptual framework that Kerry um, alluded to, to analyse <coughs> that um, practitioner's work. So um, you can see here we've got they're investigating um, the artists or the collective, their biography and their background, interests, etc. Um, what the artwork is, um, what environmental or social concerns are being investigated in the work or works, and um, how the audience is involved in the making of the work or how they engage with the work. So this was just a way for students to um, look at art, I suppose, in a way that they might not have really before. A lot of the students that choose photography and digital media are those students who don't think that they're very good at painting or drawing, so they try and, um, they're trying out these new things like taking photos, using Photoshop, etc. But um, along the way, it is a common I don't know how they developed this, but that Photoshop um, and taking photos, that's all this subject is about. So this was a way to ground it back to really strong conceptual um, historical uh, meaning. So um, this then helped them with the third phase, which is the artifacts from Burwood. So I started this phase by, so students have worked a lot collaboratively, so the, the first task was collaborative just in the um, collection of material, of, of information to create their map. Um, the second phase was um, individual, so they then created their own postcard and took their own spin on Burwood. And the third phase, again, is a group project. Um, they were put into groups based on their interests, so I was very keen to that the students didn't just um, choose a particular interest because they were with their friend and I was very keen not to have the same project six times because um, although it might be uh, it's probably boring for the kids but it's boring for the teacher as well so this made the students uh, feel that their project was really special and that they were doing something that no one in the class was which is true so the we have this thing called Moodle, which is like an online learning space. And students were asked to fill out their preferences from one to six, one being what they like the most or what they'd like to investigate the most, and six being the least. So they got to choose from animation, film, um, Photoshop, sculpture, sound, and interactive art. All of these um, areas had to include a digital or technological aspect to them. And they also were all based on a historical fact or historical facts. So um, artifacts from Burwood, we've actually finished this project now, but um, it's going to take on a bit of a life um, in a in, I'll tell you about it in a moment. but. Um, so we've got an interactive artwork which contains stories and artefacts made by students using their Photoshop skills um, and also using um, recording a story that they made up 
based on someone that existed. So there's lots of bush ranger inspired stories and um, like Melinda's group they have an obs- the students have an obsession with the mental hospital and the you know this kind of um, thing I don't know what it is um, and the audience is invited to follow one of three stories which are going to be installed in Burwood Park so um, I've just given away what I was going to say at the end so <laughs> the next thing is that they've done is a different group of students did um, a soundscape of Burwood. So they just went around Burwood over a series of weeks, collected those things, and they used their laptops because we are a government school. Um, they've got little laptops and they put them together in Audacity and installed them inside a gramophone. So there's this idea of historical, um, <coughs> like a historical link visually, because there was an old gramophone factory in Burwood. Um, and they've put this um, soundscape of the wood. So we've got like tra- trains, construction, there's lots of construction happening at the moment, um, and et cetera, all merged together. And there's, it's really kind of cute. There's a little headphone set that comes out of the gramophone. So you don't actually listen to the gramophone, which is made all from balsa, as you would, but you use it um, in a, there's a little MP3 player inside it. Um, then they've also made a short, another group have done a short film on Burwood's sordid past. They love the death and the, and the murders and the mystery um, surrounding the history of Burwood. Uh, there's another animation about Burwood Railway Station and how it's built because that um, Burwood was actually the first site for a railway station, which is very interesting. Um, they also, Burwood has a strong agricultural history. So we've got an interactive art farm where people are invited to do different things. So they do origami animals to kind of link them to that um, agricultural past. They um, are invited to find more about Bowards history. They've got little um, images that they've created with words, keywords about Burwood. Um, and they've got little images that they've um, manipulated in Photoshop where the audience is invited to draw on top of them and create their own his, uh, future of what they'd like Burwood to look like. Um, and then we've got our last group which is a group working on graphic and digital things um, which is a parallel Burwood uh, where they look at graphic, they had the graphic maps and concertina books and this is actually quite charming I find because um, this is part of their graphic book and what they've got is they've got Tour de Burwood and they've got all these famous historical sites and events and they've just changed the word wherever it is whether it's in France or whatever to Burwood to say that Burwood is the center of the universe so they've kind of created their own cheeky interpretation of that and the whole idea behind this was that they didn't have to base it on the fact they could actually string the history out a little bit and create their own history based on what they thought was engaging. Um, And Burwood Council has um, kindly agreed to support us in doing a a one-day event at Burwood Park, and that's sometime in uh, mid-October next term. And it's just, it's in the process. So um, that's, yeah, that's exciting. And I'll have a very short film to show just about what the students think. This is one of their works where the audience will be drawing over the top of the buildings. what they think about the project itself and they can tell you in their own words what they're doing. Um, In this project we're using GPS trackers to create maps around Burwood Um, and um, we all go around with a tracker and create our own maps on different aspects and we take photos as well along the way of interesting points or and put them in Photoshop to create uh, a map with pictures showing what we did or saw or For me and my partner, in terms of what we're mapping and concepts is like how many people wear earphones around Burwood because technology has like 
changed us all. So we we want like because with earphones you block out everything really. So with the with the um, the environment they don't really realize it because like earphones represent the wall that we have between the environment and us. So that's what our concept in our map is showing that like we're blocking out like what we should be curating about which is the environment because it's so important for us and that's it. Well what me and my friend are trying to create is a center point with pretty much routes to and from and where people like to go before and after and the center point would be this school so Bowood Girls High School and how they get there and back home or what they like to do so they go to Bowood Westfield I thought it was interesting because I haven't really done something like this before mm -hmm. something original like just taking a route and putting it onto Photoshop would just be quite boring and easy I guess so trying to pretty much put one route on top of the other from a center point it's a bit more challenging and it's it is really interesting seeing what everybody likes to do and also with the photos what they like to see on the way or they might stop to see something interesting like beautiful flowers or even stop to I don't know be disappointed in some of the terrible things you can see boring plain walls that we could just liven up a bit with anything really <laughs> history me and Cheryl, uh, my partner, have concentrated on was about the Burwood Railway Station because it was one of the first railway stations to be put in a suburb and it was so important for traders and marketers to come by and yeah it was like a major part but now these days we see it as nothing but just public transport and it's like has so much history to it than what we appear at. Hi, my name is Nicole DeLosa and I'm actually here representing the, my colleagues and the students of Hornsby Girls High School. Um, this was a project that we undertook as an entire art faculty, so um, which originated initially with some ideas that came from Megan Booth, who was in our faculty at the time. Um, what started out as an opportunity to revisit um, an existing installation unit that we've always done with Year 8, we certainly signed up for something that um, eventuated into something a lot more than we expected. We've chosen the Hornsby Fountain site, which also happens to be a Westfield shopping centre, so we have some connections there, and, as, and also mainly because it was a central meeting point for the area. Um, <coughs> For our local community and it's a site really familiar with students um, that travel to and from various places around Sydney in fact uh, via the Hornsby railway station. Hornsby Girls is a selective high school so the girls um, do come from a variety of areas so it made it a bit hard for us to kind of think about a site but uh, in the sense that they wouldn't necessarily have the same familiarity with it, which is why we did look at the Hornsby Fountain area. The fact that they walk through it most days, most of the students do, it was a place that they knew but maybe hadn't really looked at. And so the project was really inviting them to look at something that they thought they really knew, but in a completely different way. Um, we chose all of year eight, 120 students. And uh, originally I think the concerns for us had been that our installation unit had been at a local uh, at Narrabeen Lakes in this beautiful natural environment and we did these absolutely lovely um, aesthetic installation works. But um, here we were asking them to go into the real world with real people and you know, the concerns obviously were for us was that we wanted them to engage with an audience which was completely different to what we'd asked them to do before and we didn't necessarily know what kind of relationships or engagement you know, they were going to have and of course we wanted it to be positive but you can't guarantee that with the general public. 
Um, and so even though it was an installation based unit, we found ourselves with installations, happenings, art performances, art interventions that would engage the community to this particular site um, in a positive way via these public art events. And uh, we called our unit, uh, our project, the Permaculture of Hornsby because it, um, for the last five years, our school has been committed to a positive school philosophy and in increasing what we call flourishing in our students, staff and others, as indicated by positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning and purpose, achievement, which are concepts that have been um, put together or a framework that Seligman put together, which was a theorist that we had looked at within the entire school in our positive philosophy background. The project offered a platform for working in our local urban environment and to explore the PERMA principles of the school's positive philosophies. We encouraged the girls to examine and document levels of flourishing in our local area as indicated by the presence of PERMA. And while the PERMA aspects of the project invited the students to identify these things at the site, they were also underlying principles of the project for the students themselves and how they thought about their own installations. So when we went to the site initially, they were asked to look at how connected people were in their environment to the environment and even their levels of flourishing and happiness and so on uh, as part of a survey that um, dealt with little kind of codes for different types of engagement that they might actually see in the sites. Um, in terms of obviously the project for us, Positive Emotions was about the positive aspect of the project for the students and for the audience. Um, the engagement was with public installation based art and with the local environment, um, working with the familiar in a new way. In terms of relationships, we were hoping to build on the existing relationships that they had with each other as well as the general public. And we were hoping in terms of meaning and purpose that they would have something to communicate with others, engage them in a positive way. And there was a sense of achievement throughout the project in terms of what they were doing, what they were learning about, all the different types of art. And the fact that they were actually acting as contemporary artists um, documenting their work and so on and I think one of the biggest things for us was the idea that there may be a lack of an art product in the project and there had been discussions originally about that so we looked at ways we could actually also include some kinds of traditional art products but at the same time really explore the fact that these um, the actual installations in the public site space were going to be temporary and so we looked at documenting those. Now I have to. So it was really important that the project encouraged students to view art as an investigative tool. In particular, we looked at books by Kerry Smith that were a great tool for encouraging for um, the students an idea of an explorer or being an explorer in the world and even these kind of guerrilla art interventions and things. So we did look at uh, ways of exploring um, the processes that she's outlined in her books. Uh, we also looked at not only just the idea of mapping the physical and structural elements of the project, but also surveying the subjective qualities of the site. Um, so again, through this survey that we were talking about, we were also initially influenced by the work of Christian Knoll that explores emotional cartography, which visualises intimate biometric data and emotional experiences using technology and installations. So while the unit was specifically about installation practice and the way artists document their work, the resulting installations also fell into the parameters of performance art and interventions and certainly improved the quality of life for most participants back on the 3rd of April this year, which is when we held the interventions. Imagine 60 Hornsby girls staging 12 artworks in the areas around Hornsby Fountain. We were blessed with the weather, an excited group of students and a mostly appreciative audience. They had 70 minutes to set up their work, document their work with um, photographs and video and engage their audience and then pack it all up and disappear. 
Group one were first thing in the morning and group two were over the lunch break. So there were interesting differences in our audiences, but the engagement between the students and the general public was, on the whole, incredibly wonderful. So that gives you a bit of a background on the project itself. And just to take you through the process of how we actually came up with some of the things that we did. We started the students off uh, with this you know, visual feast of you know, installation, artists and things like that that we'd had a look at. We did actually really uh, focus in on three compulsory case studies. So we went through case studies of, in depth where we looked at um, Anthony Gormley's Inside Australia, uh, Jeremy Wood's Meridians and uh, Jean-Claude and Christo and Jean-Claude with the um, Wrapped Coast. So they were our three compulsory case studies that we did in depth using the conceptual framework. And then we also looked at, the students were allowed to research one other artist from a list, and the list that they had to choose from was, um, I had my list written down here. <laughs> oh, um, Nellie Azevedo, Joshua Allen Harris, and Mark Jenkins. So, and then they, from that, they did a comparative essay that looked at one of the compulsory case studies and one of the and their research artist. We also did a number of site visits. What actually made this really. Um, I think a, a real positive of the project was that in the past we'd done the installations as at Narrabeen Lakes as a one day excursion. And what allowed us to do this project differently was that we could walk across the road to, to the um, site and back again during our classroom time. So we kept being able to make site visits over a period of time and we decided that that actually was a real advantage for us. So in our initial site visits we did a, a large amount of data collection. So they got to do things like you know, draw in their diaries, sound recordings and so on. There's a, a big long list there of the things that they got to do. They were encouraged to really look at the site itself and different parts of the site and in lots and lots of different ways without knowing what they were going to do with it either. You know, so it was the idea that this was just kind of collecting data and bringing it back to the classroom. The first um, kind of task we did then with that, oh, actually one, one of the things I didn't mention actually on that list was that we were also looking at an app called Mappiness that um, we discussed with the students before they went uh, and those students that had iPhones had to play around with the app and actually I, I thought it was worth mentioning even though I'm, I'm not really sure how that actually transpired, it was just in constructing the PowerPoint today to talk to you about it that I realised that this was on one of the handouts that the girls got so we just didn't follow up on it so I might have to do that after the holidays. But I still thought it was worthwhile because we were looking at these apps and things and some of the students would have used those. Um, this is the first of, you know, a kind of an art-based project that they got to do. This was for their visual design covers because it was a unit that we did right at the start of the year. And so the things that they collected on the day, they got to then use as a design cover. So they looked at things like, you know, the grid and how to, in an informal grid and um, playing around with the different pieces of things that they got. And of course they were encouraged to talk about um, their experiences while they were collecting the data and so on and they knew at this stage that they were going to be doing a group based installation so they got to then discuss while they were making these works what kind of installation they were looking at doing and exploring and so on. So it was a way of kind of giving them an opportunity of immersing themselves in the site and coming up with ideas. This is an example of the documentation that the students had to produce as a, uh, at the, after having done the installations. So you can see here that um, there's photographs of the installation. There is information there about what the group had to do, their jobs on the day, uh, the aims of the project, the ideas behind it, the materials that they were going to use, especially because they were encouraged to use found objects, recycled objects or reuse objects and things like that. Things that 
you know, didn't have to be necessarily made or created for the day. Um, and these were done after the installation. This is the installation for that previous work. And after some of the silhouettes here that the students used have, were things that they had written or um, seen from photographs and images at the, in their data collection. So they've taken these kind of silhouettes. They've also included the text of some of the things that they wrote down while they were observing people in the site. On the day of the installations, students had to prepare artist statements so that they could communicate to the general public what their work was about and answer any of their <coughs> questions. Just um, an example of that. Uh, this is Anna's group and her installation and actually what she wrote in her diary after this particular installation. One of the things that was incredibly invaluable, I think, was, the, um, was watching the students engage with the general public. I mean, we had no problem thinking that the girls were going to be polite and respectful and knowledgeable about their work, which was great, but it was whether or not the public were going to be quite so interested in it. Actually, they were really wonderful. It was also quite interesting, too, to see how the, the girls come from so many different cultural backgrounds that on the day, Hornsby has quite a mixed cultural flavour these days and a lot of our students were talking to um, members of the public in their own language and so I think uh, I remember having you know observed the fact that the girls were being asked questions. I remember one girl actually being asked to you know, speak Chinese and didn't know how to so um, that was she was a bit un unhappy about that. This is an example of that particular group and their work. They use the, the frames ironically actually came from Westfield from a window display, so it's not too big a leap for the, um, the idea that shoes were being advertised. And again, there wouldn't have been a group that did not have people that they were engaging with on the day. Many works um, actually invited the audience to write things down themselves or read messages written in the works. The work, this particular work has messages about the positive nature of the fountain area and what the students had seen on the, when they were collecting their data and invited the audience then to come and, and read some of the ideas that were written on them. This work has girls inviting their audience <coughs> to look through their frame and ask them, what do you see? Write your opinion on the frame. And of course, having the coloured kind of um, cellophane inside, they're trying to get you know the, the audience to look at it even slightly differently. But it was a rather interesting experience for them too. This work had audience members write a wish on the flower and then place it in the fountain, similar to the fountain being like a wishing well. I thought you might have just been interested. I've only selected a few of the actual works themselves. But it's really nice to see what the girls were able to create and put together. It was also interesting to having to liaise with council um, and getting permission to use the site. I'm only reminded because the um, the metal pole there with the lovely coloured flowers that the girls were putting together it wasn't the property of the council, it was the property of Westfield and we hadn't obtained permission to use the pole. So the Westfield security people did ask the girls to take the work down and put it somewhere else, which they kindly did. Some interesting kind of emoticon images. So on the whole, most of the artworks were actually also really well spaced in the area and didn't interfere with each other or the groups, which was another concern we had. It was rather nicely spread out. The Q project obviously allowed us to work as part of a larger collaborative um, group, which we were very grateful for, learning about a variety of technologies that we were unfamiliar with and sharing resources. It was fantastic to have been part of this group and seeing the diversity of the projects. And a big thanks for Kerry for coordinating us all and everyone on the project. Thank you. I'm Karen Profilio from North Sydney Girls High School. And we did our project slightly differently to um, other people in that we 
kind of did an intervention into the city and used the objects that we made to kind of change the space and to change people's feelings and to actually make them sort of react in a different way. So we called it Dandelion Deeds because we use that as the metaphor for us sending out our message into the, into the wild and see how many seeds actually fell into the ground and grew or if they were just blown away and were fallow. So that's basically where that came from. Um, so the background of our project was to encourage communication. So we wanted these chance encounters and we, we hypothesised that using art in a traditional way plus a technological way would give us richer communication. And we did find some interesting findings in the end, which I will get to at the end. But basically we set out with this idea and we thought, let's try and see what happens when you use real art that the kids have made and also put a, a modern day sort of spin on it. So we used art and we also used the QR code and we used postcards, which is always very big at North Sydney. Um, we, we also then wanted to map what was going on and, and you can see that there's sort of little things that are, are common to each of the projects which actually came about c quite serendipitously really. We didn't get together and go, I know, we'll all use postcards or we'll all use concertina books or something along those lines. So basically it was interesting that because of the artists we looked at and the things we were influenced by, we came up with different ideas. Okay, so North Sydney Girls High School, anyone who doesn't know, it's a selective high school. I did this with a group of Year 11 students, there was 19 students. It's academically selective, so they're very high achievers, they really want things to sort of work very well and they throw themselves into things in a, in a fantastic way. Um, basically, visual arts at this school has pretty high profile and it's not by accident, it's because we work really bloody hard at it, let me tell you. And it helps that we have good PR and we have, you know, good kids who are willing to sort of throw themselves into the ideas. At the school there's also a technology focus, so the kids were not phased when we said we're going to use QR codes even though they didn't actually know what they were when we started, but as we went on they didn't really, sort of didn't phase them at all. <clears throat> and we're used to doing big projects at this school and this is, these are some of the projects that we've done just recently which are revamped toilets where students paint tiles to go in the toilets and we retile the whole thing. I said I didn't really want to be known as the toilet school but it looks like that's the way we're going. <laughs> so, <laughs> unfortunately. But it's quite a, quite a showpiece so, you know, it's a good thing to do. So in all of the projects at North Sydney, we start with a historical critical basis as everyone else has here. And we like to ground the students in some, some historical and critical knowledge so that they're not just working, you know, being creative out of the blue, that they've actually paid attention to what other practitioners have done and who's come before them. And, and they pick and choose little bits of what they might need. So the first thing we looked at in this project, and you really have no idea what the project is yet, but basically I will give you all the little pieces and then show you how it came together. So the first thing we looked at was vanitas because we were looking at the symbolic nature of objects. In this case, the objects we were looking at were actually flowers, but we did give them a historical background as to why artists use works and use objects to represent things, okay? And I'm not gonna go through all those PowerPoints, but they did work in class and they did a lot of research, as everyone has, and they had a background as in what was a symbolic nature and why things are symbolic and, and meanings ascribed to things. The other thing we looked at was the symbolic nature of flowers. And anyone who knows our school, it's really quite a different subject for us to be looking at. I mean, we're normally doing much more gritty, for want of a better word, and not that this wasn't cutting edge, but we thought this time we'd actually take the demographic of, this, of the people that we have, you know, 17-year-old girls, and actually take something that they might be interested in, which people might think is a taboo subject and a little bit girly, and, and turn it around and make it more cutting edge and more interesting. So we did some information about floriography, and it was, it was very lucky that I happened to be in Italy in January and picked up a fantastic book about symbolic flowers in artworks. Of course, it was a great tax deduction, so that was good too. But um, basically, I used these, these examples and we talked again about the symbolic nature of works and how flowers might have been used in the past to give meaning to, to feelings that people have. 
We also talked about flowers and plants in a contemporary sense. And this is all before they've really started doing any artwork. So this is kind of pouring into the semi-empty vessel. Not really empty, but semi-empty. We looked at a lot of current day sort of um, still life and people who use flowers and use them in a symbolic way and not in a, in a just a, a, for want of a better word, in a sort of a beautiful way but in a more interesting way. And there's a lot of artists and they looked at those and we, you know, we looked into them in quite some depth. The last thing that we did before we actually started some practical work was we looked at some truisms because I have to say that at my school there's a very high um, non-English speaking background population. And it seems that a lot of sort of the truisms that we're used to are not necessarily um, germane to sort of a, a, a sort of an Eastern type uh, you know, ethos. And so a lot of Chinese kids go, what are you talking about, miss? You know, I don't understand. So we did a bit of information about that and we, we talked about how that you can give a meaning to something using words and images and also how these can be traditional or not necessarily traditional. So of course we looked at Jenny Holzer and I don't mean it like that, I love her work personally and any work with text in it I love personally. But uh, we looked at how she's used truisms to give meaning to her works and how the actual text of the work is one of the most important things. So they've got all these things, they've got all this information and now we are going to begin the project. So in the project, oh that's very light isn't it, sorry about that. In the project there was four sort of practical areas. So first of all there was drawing and making hybrid flowers. Secondly there was making the postcards with truisms and QR codes. Then there was the interventions in the city and then the ecology boxes. And I'll talk about each of those briefly. Okay, so the first one we did was just a preliminary activity, which was very sort of fortuitous that it happened around Valentine's Day. And it was called I something you. And I don't mean that in a rude sense. It was supposed to be something like I love you, I care for you. So what we introduced the idea of symbolic flowers and truisms coming together. So this is just a simple idea. So the, the kids went to the internet and to magazines and just got flowers and tried to sort of make something that was a hybridised flower, not something that's real, but something that they've made that, you know, has meaning for themselves. And they drew that. And the one on the top is a picture and the one on the bottom is a drawing. And then we, we did it again, but this time more... Uh, in a more sophisticated and really thought through way. So this time they actually had to come up with their truism first. The other one was kind of like a simplistic meaning. They came up with their truism, then they actually researched floriography, which is um, an 18th century sort of way of giving meaning by using coded messages with flowers. So people would have sent bunches of flowers to people and they would know that, you know, yellow roses meant you know, sustained love and red roses meant something different. And even all the members of the public would know that. So we got those meanings, you know, the internet is a wonderful thing. We got those meanings and the kids illustrated their truism and these are the, some of the things. So they made the, um, the, the draft, if you like, in a sort of a Photoshop or a, a cutout from magazines and then they drew that. And it's lucky that they've got um, quite nice skills in that area. And then they use the QR code, which basically is a free website. You just go there, you type in the text you want, and it generates the code for you. You save it as a JPEG, and you get that. And when you then scan that with your smartphone, you get that, which was the truism that was related to the last drawing. So she's chosen these flowers, and she said that's how it's you know, demonstrated her meaning. They also did some more traditional drawings, and these are some that they came up with. Each kid had to do a hybrid, a black and white drawing, and a kind of a more traditional, you know, almost like a Dutch masters type drawing. From these images, we chose, uh, well, each kid actually did a QR code for all of their drawings, and there's uh, 19 kids in the class, and so each one did three. But out of all of those works, we just chose 24 to have made as postcards. I guess some I prepared earlier. Are they gone? <laughs> and um, so, we had these made up into postcards and they looked like that on the front. 
and they look like that on the back. So that when you scanned it with your phone, the message came up. So that was the first part of everything that we were doing. We also had these perforated and we had stamps on them, care of the research project. And when we used these in the intervention, we asked people to post them back to us. So that's where we're at. And here's a couple of examples of the postcards before I go on. And that's the code. If you had your phone, you could actually scan it from the screen, but you needn't do that now. Okay, so the next step was the intervention. We decided that we would set up our own little um, space in the city and that we would invite people into this space and ask them to sit down and have a look at the book we had prepared, which looks like this. Okay, which had the drawing on one side and Okay, that's all right. It had the drawing on one side and it had what it meant on the other side, which you're more than welcome to look at later. So we set up this space which had a little piece of AstroTurf and flowers all around the edges and a lovely chair in the middle and we invited people in. That's, sorry, that's what it looked like in the real, in the real world, okay? And this is how we would have, this is how we like it to look, and this is how it was set up when we set it up again at the Veda Conference at the MCA this year. But basically, we invited people in and asked them to sit down, look through the book, and decide what coded message, what secret message you would like to send to someone. And by the way, here's one with a stamp on it, just do it, and then send it back to us. So it was a really interesting experience. We did it in three lo locations, and the first one was down at uh, circular key outside the MCA. We kind of chose arty venues because we thought we might have a more uh, sympathetic audience and that's what it looked like and that's how the girls, and the girls worked in three groups of six or one had a group of seven and they decided how they would dress and so therefore they, um, that's doing it on its own, I don't know why, <laughs> but anyway. Um, so basically that's what it looked like. There, stop, stop, stop. Okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, I'll just go back a little and show you that each group dressed as they wanted to dress and so they came up with their own ideas. This group had large flowers on them and the other groups had different things. We found out that the children were very interested and parents loved to have something exciting to do with their children and make them think that it was a good thing. And also the people who were most interested in speaking to us were the people who were least likely to have the, the technology they needed to actually be able to read the code. So it was sort of interesting finding out what went on. Older people were very happy to sit down and take a card and were very, very impressed with the girls' drawings but had no idea what a QR code was. So. We actually got moved on, um, and I had a, had a photo, but I don't know, it's whizzed past. Um, we got moved on by the ranger because we didn't actually seek permission, we just set up. And we also always decided it was easier to apologise than to seek permission. So that's what we did. But that was good fun, and the kids really found that a great idea. There was all of us tramping back down to um, outside McDonald's. The next place we went to was outside the art gallery, and as we had hypothesised, it was a really... Um, sympathetic and really interested audience and, and it didn't hurt that it was the day that Westpac had been giving out free tickets to the um, the Archibald so there was a quite a good audience there. So we grabbed people as they came out of the art gallery and we, um, we asked them to interact with us. So we were sitting there and we did get quite a lot of interest there. See there's people taking photos of the artworks and people taking cards and people talking to us about the plight of the arts in education and all sorts of very interesting things. And the girls are really getting into it. And as you can see, these girls have decided to do garlands, hair garlands. And, um, and people like, this is a long shot, and then these people like really getting into it, going through each page and really being very interested. And the kids being very involved and enjoying themselves. 
And the next place we went to was Chinatown, which a bit like Nicole, we thought, well, let's just give it a go. Let's see what it's like, you know, Asian kids in Chinatown. Will it be more successful? Will it be less successful? So it was actually quite interesting. And the way we had to interact with people was quite different, whereas they were happy to kind of, somewhat happy to come and sit down in our chair there most people were really too busy to pay any attention but once you got their attention we had them so it was actually a really good thing so that was what we asked them to sit down into and then we had to put up the stand so that it wasn't as imposing so that they could actually kind of look at the stand while they were on the run but the girls started talking to people and really got them quite involved in what they were doing and it was, it was actually a very positive um, experience there. And the kids were talking to them in Chinese and they were less wary of them when they were talking to them in Chinese. And uh, it's quite fun because look at the look on their, on their faces. <laughs> what? <laughs> but then these people, you know, they're a little bit apprehensive and the girl's trying to encourage them into the space, but nonetheless. And this is um, a guy that t she's working with quite hard here. So he's going, you know, what do you want about? Then when he started looking at the book, he was actually really quite involved and she's explaining it to him. And he, he really got into it in the end and took lots of postcards with him, so that was nice. He was a chap who liked to stay and took one of every postcard. I think it could have been the girls that were enticing him and not so much the postcards, but anyway. And this is them standing in the street giving the postcards out in the end, just saying, free postcards, would you like one? Because it was a, a very different audience and that was great for the girls to realise that as well. Most people want to buy the flowers when we're in Chinatown. And then we had this lovely lady who come down with her um, partner and she was so involved that she's actually downloaded the app. I'm showing her how to do it. She downloaded the app on the spot and she's going, wow, I love this, you know, and so that was very good. And then at the end, we packed up. And so each time we had to pack up, drive, move to the next spot and uh, just some pretty pictures of the flowers and us sticking them in the car. <laughs> Okay, so the three interventions were really quite successful. Even though we gave out about 200 cards, we really only got about 30 to 40 back, even though they had stamps on them, which was a bit sad. So what we were hoping for, the track part and the code part, was that when we got this information back, we will have tracked where people sent things. So did our dandelion become cultivated or did it just fall on the ground and die? We had some really great responses. The people who did send it back, sent it from Malaysia and Canberra and Brisbane, but a lot of people in Sydney just kind of didn't bother, I think. So the people gave us very good feedback on, yes, we thought it was fun, and yes, we thought it was great, and they really enjoyed it. So Then I thought, what are we, what are we gonna do at the start of the project? I thought, what are we going to do with this, and how are we going to show what we've done? We decided to make these ecology boxes, we called them. So I saw this great exhibition in New York this year in the print it, um, show, print out show, and it was balsa put together. So what the kids did was they made balsa boxes. They somehow represented what had happened either on the day or after the day. So a lot of them had photocopied parts of the works, photocopied parts of their postcards, mapped parts of their postcards. So that you can see here, I don't know if you can see it that well in that one, but the next one, you can actually see the string patterns of where things were given out, where they came back from, what the student did with it. A lot of them had scrunched up stamps and they also photocopied a lot of the um, responses we got back from people. And they looked really good. They made a very nice art object. In the end, we also put a light inside them and it was kind of like, you know, very symbolic about lighting the way and what we'd found and all of those sort of things. These are some pictures of the boxes at our art exhibition this year. And that's it at the school art ex exhibition. And you can't actually see the lights, but that's what it was like. And basically, that's our project. And that's what we did. And just in case you would like to see any more. Oh, boxes, thank you. Um, we've also got... Oops, get back. You <laughs> bad thing. Yes. We've also got a blog where kids have put their work up. And so in case you would like to see any more, maybe that's full screen. Yes, there we are. Um, you can see all the works up here and the meanings behind them. 
Uh, it's one of the way, one of the students actually linked their postcard to this blog that she'd made. She was so excited by the project that she wanted to take it a bit further. So basically I got everyone to, to upload their works to that. And that's what we did. What I was saying, one last thing, what I was saying was that we hypothesised would the communication be richer. In the end, who really knows? I know the one thing it did do was it made the kids super confident because later in the year we did an installation task and because they had had this experience of interacting with the public, they did some amazing things on a very large scale that I'm not sure they would have taken on had they not been able to do this project first. So the fact that we only got 30 or 40 cards back was communication richer, but the fact that the kids were able to really push themselves into another project, I think it was. So I think that's how it worked out. Thank you.